What's cracking YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. We are officially back in this thing. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. As always, it's your boy Nick. If you're new to the channel, welcome. I apologize for the lack of content lately. A lot of you guys probably know I was out in California on vacation, as you can see by my tomato face. But we're back. It's back to business, it's back to fantasy football. We're all done with the team outlooks, so I'm going to be getting out a lot of content that's just kind of random out there that I think will provide a lot of value to you guys across the board. Today we're getting into my top six late round sleepers at the wide receiver position. These are all guys going after pick 120. If you're in a deeper league, 12 team league, 14 team league, these are guys you're going to get in the later rounds of your draft. And some of these guys can be make or break for your season. These are those, these are where those, those no name. I mean, obviously you've probably heard of all these guys just because of because the interwebs and that's how it works nowadays. But these are guys that have a lot of potential to be the breakout players and the guys that come out of nowhere and kind of save your season for you. So again, we're getting into my top six favorite late round wide receivers this year. Let's get it. First up on my list, we have, if you watched, I think it was my last video I put up, was the Tennessee Titans team outlook. You know I get down with my boy Rashard Matthews, which is why he's number one on this list. Right now, going off the board, 124th overall, wide receiver 51. Now Matthews, throughout his career, when given the opportunity, has always performed, has always lived up to any of the hype. Production has always been there. And now he finds himself in an offense that that, that'll probably roll this year. So we take a look back at Matthew's success, Matthew's production over the last few years, right? I went back to the beginning of 2015 when he was with the Miami Dolphins last year with the Tennessee Titans. There were 16 games where Matthew saw five targets or more. Five targets, not a ton of opportunity, but it's opportunity nonetheless. So in those 16 games that Matthew saw five targets or more, he had at least 85 receiving yards or a receiving touchdown in 12 of 16. I don't think you understand. I, I didn't go back, but I can almost guarantee that like, that there's probably an elite group of guys, maybe three or four other guys that fit that mold right there. In their last 16 games, 12 of 16, 85 receiving yards or a receiving touchdown. And over that span, he averaged over five receptions, 73 receiving yards, and .56 touchdowns per game. Now, when you prorate those numbers out to a full season, I mean, obviously, it's no guarantee that he's going to see five targets a game, but I think that's, I don't think that's outlandish. I don't think it's crazy. Prorate those numbers out to a full season, full 16 games, you're getting 82 catches, 1,173 yards, and nine touchdowns. That would put him at wide receiver seven in standard, wide receiver eight in PPR last year, and he finished his wide receiver 11 in standard already last year, so I don't think it's... Uh, while I do think those numbers are definitely inflated a little bit, I don't think he'll hit those numbers. I still think he returns great value for where you're getting him. And he did that as he was wide receiver 11 in, in fantasy last year, while the Titans were one of the least pass heavy teams in the NFL. Of course, they did go out and grab Corey Davis with their six round, uh, with their six overall pick. They signed Eric Decker through free agency. So you're thinking like, there's going to be no targets really available for Rashard Matthews, but you know, Tajay Sharp is clearly on the bench. Kendall Wright is not in Tennessee anymore. And that's 126 targets up for grabs that those three wide receivers will likely split. And that's on top of the 108 targets that Matthew saw last year already. Now here's kind of the situation right now for the wide receivers in Tennessee. We have Corey Davis who was coming back from offseason ankle surgery and now he, he pulled his hamstring. He re-injured his hamstring a couple weeks ago and he's missed both of the first two preseason games and he remains week to week. Uh, head coach Mike Malarkey said that he is on pace to play in preseason. For his sake, he's going to need to get on that field for that third preseason game, which, you know, is the dress rehearsal for NFL teams. But that's a big blow to a rookie. That's big developmental time. That's that's time you need to be building uh, chemistry, be building timing with your quarterback, with your offense as a whole. So as I see it right now, Rashard Matthews has to be ahead of Corey Davis on the depth chart. Davis was taking a lot of first team reps prior to the hamstring pull, but this is time that, that you see actual game speed and, and you make a lot of progress as a rookie. And when you look at Decker, right, he is getting acclimated to the offense still. He's still pretty new to the offense. He does look phenomenal, as you can see. I'm gonna try to post this video up. Right here, I'm not sure if it's gonna work.
But you guys already know how much I love Decker this year. I think he will be the number one fantasy option in Tennessee. But he's going to play the slot in three wide receiver sets. And then him and Rashard Matthews, Corey Davis, are all going to split reps on the outside in two wide receiver sets. So I, I think there's going to be plenty of opportunity to go around. So as it stands right now, I think Rashard Matthews is the most concrete, the most solid outside weapon that the Titans have to offer. And I know Tennessee wasn't a huge passing team in terms of volume last year, but I'm really looking for that to increase. Because they brought in Davis, because they brought in Decker, they lost Anthony Fasano, who was a great pass blocking tight end, and they did two tight end formations a lot more than, I think they were like the third highest two tight end formation team in the NFL last year. They lose a really good run blocker in Anthony Fasano, bring in three stud wide receivers on the outside, they're definitely going to be looking to move the ball more as Mariota progresses as a quarterback. I think this offense as a whole just takes a step towards the passing game a little more, and that's just very good for Matthews. As you can see, he just needs the opportunity to produce. Next up, numero dos. We got my boy Zay Jones out in Buffalo. 148 overall getting picked. Wide receiver, 50. Eight. Now there's been a lot of turnover in Buffalo all offseason. A lot of madness, a lot of reconstruction on the roster. We saw Sammy Watkins move over to the Rams. They acquired Jordan Matthews. Anquan Bolin signed to the team for about 18 minutes, then retired. So where does that leave Zay Jones? That leaves the second round rookie pick with a ton of opportunity. Here's what I see out of Buffalo as a whole, right? I feel like they're doing everything in their power to make sure Tyrod Taylor is not there franchise quarterback, right? It's clear. They don't want him there, which is why they made all these trades, right? Next year, they have two first round picks, two second round picks, two third round picks. They're going to load up on that offense and really look to rebuild. So I don't think they want Taylor trying to win them games. I don't think they're going to be looking for him to make big plays. And that's the reason they got rid of Sammy Watkins, right? Who excels as a deep threat. They're going to be looking to utilize short passes. They're going to be looking to run the ball a lot. They're going to be looking to keep things tight and compact on offense. And that plays to Zay Jones' strengths. Last year, Zay Jones set the FBS record, single season record for most receptions. He had 158 catches on 164 targets. So he dropped six balls on 164 targets. I wanna pull up these these metrics for Zay Jones, that, you know, his workout metrics. You could see he is in the 79th percentile or better in all these scores, 40 yard dash, weight adjusted speed score, burst score, agility score, catch radius, his spark score is 88th percentile. He is just a physical specimen when you look at him overall. He's 6'2", 200 pounds, so he has really good size, 4'4", 5 speed, agile, burst, catch radius. He can really do it all. And I think the way this offense is tailored is really going to play to his strength, right? Besides him, they do have Jordan Matthews, but he suffered a chip fracture in his sternum. That sounds terribly painful. About 14 seconds into his first practice. So he hasn't been practicing. He's guaranteeing that he'll be ready for week one, but he also literally said that anytime he moves his arms, he's in a ton of pain. Good thing uh, wide receivers don't, don't need to use their arms that much. Simply put, Zay Jones is gonna get as much opportunity and as many targets as he can handle right now in that offense. He's a combination of size, good measurables, and opportunity. It doesn't really get better than those three things, even if the bills are not tailored to the passing game. I think he's gonna be a major PPR play in 2017, or a major value, of course, like I said, 148 overall, wide receiver 58. He is going to be someone that you should definitely be owning if you're in a PPR league. All right, numero three. As we move down the list, this one might take a lot of y'all by surprise. We have a Jets receiver. His name is Robbie Spaghetti Anderson. Going 163rd overall off the board, wide receiver 62. Now, this is just him having you know, zero competition. I thought Keenchi and Nunwa had zero competition and he went and went snapped his shit up, had to fix, refix his neck. I don't know what's out. He's out for the year. Got rid of Brandon Marshall, got rid of Eric Decker this offseason. So the Jets are kind of stuck with literally no names at the wide receiver position. Robbie Anderson, I talked about it in my Jets preview even before the Inunua injury. Robbie Anderson was a deep sleeper of mine to keep an eye on. Now that Inunua's gone, I really, really like Anderson as a late round pick here. Anderson would be like a third or fourth string wide receiver on almost any other NFL team, but the Jets aren't any other NFL team. Now the reports this offseason are like, have been crazy about Anderson, right? Anywhere from he's out of shape, he's in trouble, he's not even a roster lock, he's probably gonna get cut. And then he balls out in that first preseason game, catches three balls, 71 yards, including a really, really nice deep strike from Josh McCowan, which is a great sign because McCowan, McCowan has to be the starter there. You can't put Hackenberg or Bryce Petty on in the starting lineup. So we saw a nice little connection between McCowan and Anderson already this offseason. If for some reason, it, Christian Hackenberg is a 0% chance he's the starter. If Bryce Petty somehow gets the start, I like that even more because when he was in last year, they I don't know if this was like a second team or whatever string, the fourth team connection they had throughout practice. 
but him and Robbie Anderson were on the same page in games last year. There were four games that Bryce Petty was the, the quarterback for the New York Jets last year, and in those games, Mr. Pasta, Mr. Spaghetti, averaged 4.25 catches, nearly nine targets, 77 receiving yards and 0.5 touchdowns a game. 77 yards and 0.5 touchdowns a game on nine targets when Petty's at, in, in at quarterback. So he's just forcing him the ball. The reason I call him spaghetti, because he's built like spaghetti, man. He's 6'3", 190 pounds, soaking wet. He's probably like 180 to 185 pounds, actually. Phenomenal speed for that size. 4'4", 140 yard dash. So 6'3", 4'4", 1. He excels down the field. Last year, he posted an 85.7 success rate percentage on contested catches. Now, among 86 qualified receivers last year, he had the highest average depth of target, 17.0. He had a nice 14 yards per reception mark. So his ability to play the ball downfield is what will make up a lot of his production. So as the unquestioned starter in this New York Jets offense, which is far from like a good, that's honestly probably a negative thing, but he is a lock to see 100, 100 plus targets. You're not getting someone at pick 150 or later that is a lock to see 100 plus targets. It will never happen in fantasy. And the fact that his skill set is set up that he'll see a lot of downfield passes, like he's gonna see 100 plus targets and a high percentage of those targets will probably be deep balls. So regardless, you know, he's set up for some pretty big production, I would say. You know, it wouldn't it wouldn't shock me if we saw him put up 55 to 60 catches, around 900 yards, and the touchdown upside is very limited in the offense but maybe like three to five touchdowns. That's really useful in deeper leagues, and that's really useful at pick 150, 160 or later. You look at last year, right? He caught 42 passes, 587 yards, and two touchdowns. And that was despite being like their fifth option in the passing game behind Marshall. Decker was obviously gone for most of the season. Kinsey and Nunwa, Blau Powell, Matt Forte coming out of the backfield. Like they had a ton of other options, and he still managed to catch 42 balls in almost 600 yards. So this year as the unquestioned starter, who's definitely going to see 100 plus targets as a big deep threat, he could definitely, definitely do some damage for you. And the team as a whole, you know, they're gonna be terrible. Tied for the lowest over under from Vegas, four and a half wins. It's safe to say they are gonna be throwing the ball a lot. He's the only person on this team outside of Blau Powell that I'm even slightly considering drafting. Next up, as we keep moving down, we're getting, we're getting to ADPs 200 and later now. This is my man's Paul Richardson out in Seattle. Pick 211 overall, wide receiver 77. So yeah, we're getting in there. This is someone, especially I'm, I'm in a keeper league where if you if you draft someone in the 10th round or later, I'm looking to get Richardson as one of my late round picks because I think he has the potential to have a really big breakout year and I think he'll be really valuable. He could be one of those guys that maybe he's going in the fourth, fifth, sixth round come this time next year. Richardson's always been ridiculously talented. His raw skills are there. He just hasn't had the chance to really prove it. He, he's dealt with a lot of injuries over the last couple of years, but he's just 25 years old. So there's plenty of time left for this kid to develop and become a part of this offense. And now he, he finally is, right? In practices, he's running with the ones on three wide receiver sets. He's actually running with the ones on two wide receiver sets. That's probably until Tyler Lockett gets back, but he's getting a ton of first team reps with Russell Wilson, which is always a good thing. Playing ahead of, you know, Jermaine Curse. Jermaine Curse is, if you could describe Jermaine Curse in two words, it would be extra medium. Curse has just plummeted down the depth chart. Paul Richardson is taking over that spot. In their first preseason game, Paul Richardson made an incredible diving catch down the sideline. He did suffer a really, really minor sprained AC joint in his shoulder, but he's already back at Seahawks practice, so he'll be fine. He'll be ready to go for this week's preseason game and into the regular season. It does speak to his injury concern as he's been a, he's been brittle over the last few years and this doesn't help but he's one of those guys who lays it all out on the line who's not afraid to get dirty not afraid to get into contested catches so that's part of you know the game plan for him like i said right he's been running as wide receiver too when tyler lockett gets back it'll probably be lockett and baldwin when they're doing three receiver sets, he will be on the outside though. So there should be a good uh, amount of opportunity. You look at his passing offense, they've increased their pass attempts every single season since Russell Wilson's been in the league. No reason for that trend not to continue as you know they're struggling with depth at running back. Their running back game is not gonna be their strength this year. You have Eddie Lacy, who's still fat and slow. Rawls and Procise are already dealing with injuries. So passing game is gonna be something that they're gonna have to heavily rely on. So even as the third option there on the outside, Paul Richardson should still see plenty of snaps. Let's talk about him as, as a player, right? He's around 6'1", 185 pounds. He has elite 4'4", four, four speed. 4'4", four, four, 40 speed. And the strongest part of his game is his athleticism. It, he, his ability to jump, to leap up and grab the ball out of the air. So even if he's only 6'1", 
he can jump up the same height and, and reach balls at the climax, the same as like a, a 6'3", 6'4". Reminds me of like A.J. Green, the way he can pinpoint the ball at the top and kind of and make those context, contested catches. He's one of those guys you'll see on the Sports Center Top 10, I, I bet, a few times this year. And he really came on at the end of 2016 last year. So you look at the last four games of 2016, which was including playoffs against tough teams. He caught 15 balls for 213 yards, and he scored twice. You can see he became a big part of that offense down the stretch, and they relied on him in these big games in the playoffs so it'll be his fourth year like I said still 25 has plenty of time to hit his prime you know he's coming into the prime years for wide receiver he knows the playbook right he's been there like I said for four years so he will never have trouble knowing the offense he'll never have trouble kind of getting chemistry with Wilson because he's been practicing with him for the last four years Wilson's fully healthy that I'm expecting a big bounce back from this passing offense. And Richard, as I see it, is the most equipped player to, to catch balls on the outside, right? You have Doug Baldwin, who will probably man the slot, and you have Tyler Lockett, who's a small guy. They don't have a guy like Richardson. They haven't had a guy like Richardson for a while. So it's going to be exciting to see how he fits into that offense and and, and see if, if Russell Wilson actually, you know, utilizes him as a deep threat, because that's not something he uses all the time. But So I love Richardson. I think there's a decent shot he ends up in the top 36 by year's end, and you can get him as wide receiver 77. So we move along. Next guy on my list is my boy Alan Hearns. Overall 204, wide receiver 76. So the emergence of Marquise Lee, this younger stud from USC, kind of scared me off Hearns a little bit. But Marquise Lee suffered a high ankle sprain, and he's supposed he's going to be out for a while. There's no guarantee that he's going to be back for regular season games yet, so he might be a little out of shape. It might take him a little time to get acclimated back into the offense. You look at Hearns. He's already a proven producer in the NFL. He's just a year removed from a 64, 1,031 yards, 10 touchdown campaign. That, like, shocks me how forgotten he is. And I understand why, right? Because he's playing on the Jaguars where they could barely support one wide receiver. Now they have this quarterback confrontation between Blake Bortles, Chad Henning, like who's even going to be the starter? Whoever it is is not going to be that good. And to be honest with you, I'm not really sure I expect Hearns to have a phenomenal year. My thing is just, you could do a lot worse than, than a guy like Hearns after pick 200. Look at these splits of Hearns when Marquise Lee plays versus when he doesn't play. Like I said, Lee has that high ankle sprain and he's supposed to miss anywhere from four to six weeks. So if, if they start the season without Lee in the lineup and Hearns is available, like you, you could just see the numbers that he puts up without Lee there, which are super useful. So with Hearns, it's like, you know, he's 6'3", about 200 pounds, so really good outside size. He's just 25 years old, super young still, and he's already posted years of production, right? Look at his rookie and sophomore years combined, 1,706 receiving yards and 16 touchdowns. That's a ton of production for someone who's just 25 years old and everyone's completely forgotten about him. They used him too much in the slot last year. I think they'll move him back to the outside and he'll produce a lot better. And I know there's tons of, you know, red flags here in terms of his production. There's no risk because you don't have to take him anywhere early. But you could do a lot worse than the wide receiver two in this offense who's already proved that he could put up big years. Now the last guy on my list, a lot of you guys have probably heard the name. I'm not sure if most of you actually know who this guy is. And I, I touched on him briefly when I had the uh, collaboration video with Fantasy Football Advice, the other YouTube channel. And I spoke on him in the Chiefs Outlook. And it's just kid Chris Conley from Georgia. And he was on my radar before the preseason started. And now he might have even become a target of mine in drafts. Conley has all the raw tools to be a, a legit playmaker, right? 6'3", 210 pounds, can run like the wind. But we've had Alex Smith as the quarterback, right? And that, his skill set, Conley's deep threat, athletic skill set does not match up with how Alex Smith plays. And this Chiefs offense goes down the field. The best part about what's happening this offseason in Kansas City is the Alex Smith, Patrick Mahomes quarterback battle. Now obviously, Smith is gonna be the starter there, but all the reports are just talking about how Smith has just been taking the leash off himself, right? Attempting a lot more deep balls. He's definitely feeling the heat from Mahomes. Because Mahomes is this big, strong arm quarterback who is not afraid to chuck the ball. And that's something that a lot of Chiefs fans have been missing out on with Smith, who takes, you know, the dink and dump passes. His average depth of throw is always one of the dead last ones in the NFL. Now he's He's attempting a lot more deep balls, and we saw that in the first preseason game. Conley caught two balls for 46 yards, both of them really nice catches. He also had an 83-yard touchdown called back by a terrible pass interference call. So he was looking at a monster monster performance in their week one preseason game had that touchdown not been called back. But it just goes to show you, you know, the potential he has and, and what could be in this offense. Now I want to bring this up. You see Chris Conley, right? You see his scores, the 40-yard dash, the speed score, 
the burst score, and the catch radius. They're all ranked so, 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 so high. This is basically what I was telling you about as, as far as his raw tools go. 97th percentile in a spark score. So super athletic, really incredible speed, really good size. So he'll be a legit deep threat for this team and a team that's looking to throw the ball downfield more. You have Jeremy Macklin gone, which leaves Chris Conley as the unquestioned number two in that offense, right? Like, what does that mean though? He'll have to compete with Tyree Kill, of course. He'll have to compete with Travis Kelsey for targets, but I still think there's plenty of opportunity for Conley here. So basically, I think Patrick Mahomes' skill set would fit Conley way better than Alex Smith because like I said he'll take a lot more deep shots but the pressure's been put on Smith and I think that will happen either way now because if Smith can't lead this team and he's not producing and he's not making those big plays they are going to turn to Mahomes eventually and if you're in the in the group of people that doesn't think Tyreek Hill will really be the number one there that's even more so for a reason to you to get on the Conley bandwagon if Tyreek Hill has a down year if he takes a step back he regresses he finds out that he can't be the number one option there, they're not gonna target him 150 times, right? Chris Conley will get a shitload of targets there. And if Ty Freak does ball out this year, that means safeties, that means a lot of defensive attention on his side, leaving Chris Conley open for a lot of those downfield balls. So for me, it's a win-win. I see nothing but positives for this kid, Chris Conley, who should see 75 to 80% of the snaps on the outside in this offense. And that's the list for me. You have a lot of guys who I like who are tall, athletic, make a lot of plays in a position that they could see a ton of opportunity here. Some of them are on good teams, some of them are on not so good teams. They're all guys that I'll be looking towards in the later rounds, especially if you go RB heavy and you're looking for kind of breakout players, guys that might by season's end, you know, return huge value on where you're picking them. And they're good They're good to look at in terms of keeper and dynasty because a lot of these guys are really, really young. And a lot of these guys haven't really hit their prime yet. And, and they're going to be progressing. And I think a few of these guys will really hit it big in 2017. And you'll be happy you hit them up. So that's the end of this video. Also, if you purchase the draft guide, like I said, obviously, I email out new updated rankings every week following the preseason games. I emailed them out yesterday. So if for some reason you didn't get them, please let me know. Just shoot me an email. My email is linked below in the description. Let me know and I'll send it right over to you. If you haven't purchased the draft guide yet, you can do that right here or you can go to my site, which is also linked in the description, bdgeat.com. Follow me on the Twitter. Subscribe to the channel if you're new and you enjoyed. And please give that video the thumbs up. Next episode, we'll come back to the same format, but with running backs. So stay tuned. Peace, y'all.